All right, Ephesians chapter number 6. Again, we're going to be looking in verse 13, but we're going to add another verse this week. Verse number 16. Ephesians chapter number 6, verse number 13. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Today we are looking at a vital piece of the armor of God. All the pieces are important, but the extent to which we need to use the shield of faith makes it integral to our success in the spiritual warfare. But I want us to begin in verse 16 looking towards the latter part of the verse first because it helps us to understand the battle which we are engaged and how to use this shield of faith. Folks, the enemy is active. As we read there, it says, Ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. What does that mean? It means that the wicked are shooting. There are fiery darts being hurled at the children of God. Passivity is not an option in spiritual warfare. Hold your place in Ephesians. Let us go to the book of 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter number 5. 1 Peter chapter number 5. To give you the context, Peter is writing to elders, pastors, and he says in verse 8, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. The devil is hunting. The wicked hurl fiery darts. We are engaged in a great spiritual warfare. It's just interesting to note, and we'll get to Job much later in the sermon, but um, if we go back to Job... It says that there was an appearing before God, and Satan came also, and God asked Satan, where have you been? And Satan says, from going to and fro in the earth. What does Peter tell us Satan is doing? He's walking, seeking whom he may devour. Isn't it interesting that God at that point says, hey, have you considered my servant Job? And Satan says, I can't touch him. <laughs> See, Satan was looking for those to devour. He was looking for those who were weak. He was looking for those that were not trusting in God, whose faith was small, that he can devour them, that he can chew them up, that he can get them to denounce God, that he can get them to, to stumble in their faith, that he can get them to, to ruin their testimony. Satan is looking to devour the children of God. He can never have our soul but he can steal our joy, he can steal our testimony, if we're not, as Peter says, be sober, be vigilant. Notice in verse 9 of 1 Peter chapter 5, he says, whom, that is the devil, resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world these elders would have been under attack. And they would have been feeling the attacks to their faith. Again, think about first century Christians. What did it mean to be a first century Christian? It means possibly when you chose Christ, you lost your job, you lost your family, you lost a lot of things. Those trials, those tests would want to make us question our faith. Do you really want to trust Jesus and be unemployed, possibly destitute? Do you really want to trust Jesus and lose all of your family and friends? 
Do you really want to trust Jesus? And those afflictions would cause them to question. Again, note the word afflictions here. The same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren as Satan is roaring around. Here's the great thing. He doesn't just pick on one person. And the other thing I like to note about Satan, do you know that Satan is not omnipresent like God is? Doesn't it feel like it sometimes? Because it just seems like Satan is everywhere and Satan is working everywhere. Well, there's only one Satan. There's only one devil. But he's got a lot of people on or a lot of people. A lot of humans follow him. But there's a lot of evil spirits that are on his side too. And they're working all over the place on the children of God. So don't think you're the only one suffering. Don't think you're the only one that the screws are being tightened down on. Because it's everywhere. But how do we resist the devil? He said, in the faith. Let me give you another example. Let's go back to 2 Corinthians. Keep your finger there in Ephesians. Let's go back to 2 Corinthians. Chapter number 12. And look at Paul's testimony for a minute. 2 Corinthians chapter number 12, verse number 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 7. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given unto me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above, me uh, above measure. Notice, where did this affliction come from? Satan, the messenger of Satan. Now, did God use this messenger of Satan for a good thing? Yeah, but it was still Satan trying to bug Paul, trying to get Paul to turn around, trying to get Paul to stop. And God, God, Paul says, for this thing, because I had this thorn in the flesh, for this thing I besought the Lord thrice, three times, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches and necessities and persecutions in distress for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Folks, Paul had to learn to deal with these things. God said to him, I'm not going to take them away. My grace is sufficient for thee. And so what did Paul have to trust? He had to trust in the grace of God. He had to trust in the power and the strength of God to get him through these things. He needed to stop looking at his own power and turn everything over to the Lord. We might call that living by faith. Now, the same enemies of Peter and Paul, folks, are still present today. There are things that will come into our lives that will shake our faith. Jesus Christ never promised the Christian a bed of roses. He never said this life would be easy and everything would be good. There will be difficulties that come. Matter of fact, Jesus said, Think not that I am come to send peace on the earth, but a sword. Father's going to be against mother, all these different ones, right? Father against son, and, and daughter against mother, and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law, and all these different things. People are not going to agree with you over who Jesus is. And it's going to cause conflict. And these things might shake our faith. If our faith is shaken and fails, we will stumble and possibly be gravely injured in our spiritual battle. Folks, it could cost us our testimony for the Lord. Now, going back to Ephesians chapter 6, I want to make note of one thing. The shield of faith is not saving faith. Saving faith was when we put on the breastplate of God's righteousness. That was earlier, right? That was the first thing we put on. We had the belt of truth that everything is based on, but once we learn the truth, what do we do? We trust in God for his righteousness, and he gives us that breastplate of righteousness that gives us life. God's righteousness comes to us through trusting in the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ as payment for our sins. The shield of faith, then, 
is for our daily living. Once saved, always saved. But faith for daily living is going to be a continual struggle. Another thing we note here in Ephesians chapter number 6 and verse 16, talking about, you know, the, the wicked are shooting, but it says all the fiery darts of the wicked. The wicked have a variety and a multiplicity of weapons. But the great thing is the shield of faith works for all of them. Satan and the powers of darkness will try to attack you on more than just one area. When we think we are strong in one area, you know, hey, you know, I've got this sin taken care of. I'm not going to worry about that sin. Uh, you know, I've conquered that sin and my life is great, right? What happens when temptation comes from over here then? What happens when there's a sin over here? Matter of fact, Paul toward the Corinthians, you know, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. That's in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12. The context, right? He said, look at Israel. Israel failed miserably God time and time and time and time again. And they're given to us as an example of what not to do so that we don't follow the same path. But you know what happens when we look at Israel? Today we look at Israel and go, man, those Israelites were so dumb. How could they have a physical manifestation of God right there on the top of Mount Sinai and go to worship in a golden calf. That's just dumb. How can we who are children of God, who have experienced the living God, turn away from Him? We do the same thing as those Israelites. So before you start looking down your nose at the Israelites and before we get on our high horse thinking, we're all that because we're God's righteous people, be careful. You're lifted up with pride, and guess what pride is? <laughs> pride is pretty much a number one sin. We often think that we're better than Israel, but folks, we're not. We need to be aware, because the devil, as a roaring lion, is walking, seeking whom he made of fire. He's looking for the loophole. He's looking for the chink in the army. He's looking for that one place. So we have to be on guard against all the fiery darts. And how do we be on guard against all the fiery darts? <laughs> Have faith in God. Now, it said there in verse 16, above all, taking the shield of faith. And sometimes we look at that word above all and we say, it's the most important thing. But actually there's a different connotation to it. The word can actually be translated upon all. And to understand this, we have to put ourselves back in first century Think about Paul. Paul is using armor as an illustration. Where would he see a bunch of armor in the first century? The Romans. The Romans were very astute in their weaponry. They knew how to use armor. And they knew how to use a shield. How did the Romans fight? Well, I got a picture here, and I'll share it. This is called uh, testudo. It's the Latin word for tortoise. You see all these guys in the picture? They, they have their shields. And the guys in the front have their shields forward. And then the next row of people put their shields above the guy in front of them's head and their own head. And the next rank does the same thing. And the next rank does the same thing. And this is a, a formation that the Romans would use when they would go and attack somebody that had a lot of artillery. Can you see where their shields are? They're being held up. They are above everything else so that they can deflect the incoming fiery darts of the wicked. They would literally interlock their shields to form a protective barrier against the projectiles that were coming at them. We have to hold up our faith above all. And on a side note, this is a really cool illustration of a local New Testament church working in unity by faith. When we all put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and we're working together and functioning as one unit, 
Notice the strength that would be there against the wiles of the devil. What would happen if one guy in this formation happened to put his shield down? Guy in the middle puts his shield down. Guess what opened up? A hole. And not just he would be affected, but the whole group would be affected because now the darts can get in in that one hole. And they can hit not just the guy that's there, but the guy next to him and the guy next to him. And then bigger holes open up. And then we see maybe churches split because we stop having faith in God and start doing things in our own power. I just think that's a, a great application. Think about that first century Roman legion there, that unit working together. But they had to have their shields up to deflect the fiery darts. How do we apply this? Folks, this may make us a little uncomfortable. When the fiery darts are hurled at us, the simple question becomes, do we trust God? Let me give you some examples. There's a death in the family. Tragedy. Maybe it was a surprise. If we react by saying, Oh, me. Oh, what is the Lord doing? Oh, I just, why would God do this to us? Why would God take this person? Doesn't he know how much we need them? Doesn't he know? Well, the answer is, yeah, God knows. And God cares. Are we going to trust him? More of a, a modern day application, maybe. Children are a gift from God. But in our world today, some children are seen as nuisances. We have a, a term that people have begun to use called abortion. Because we don't want a child. But all the people that push for abortion like to, to use an example. They say, well, what about the health of the mother? Abortion should be legal if it affects the health of the mother. So we trade one life for another life. Let's stop and think about this for just a moment. What if we trust God for the outcome? Well, you, you could lose your wife. Yeah, I very well could. But my God's big enough to take care of it. Would it hurt? Sure. But will we trust God with the outcome? What about, you know, maybe one not so serious. What about just a temptation to sin? Something pops up and you know, I, I know it's wrong. But man, it would just feel so good right now. I know it's wrong, but it would just be so fun right now. I, I know it's wrong. Hey, do you think God called it a sin for no reason? Do you think, do you think God just arbitrarily said, ah, I'm just going to make this, this, this something a sin uh, because, you know, I, I just feel like it. No, God knows that every sin that we commit literally hurts us in the process. God knows this. And so what do we have to do? When that temptation comes along, we have to say, you know what? God knows what's best. You can trace this all the way back to the Garden of Eden. Eve was there, and Satan came along and said, does God really being fair to you, or is God really being fair to you? Because Eve, God knows if you eat from that tree of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, you're going to be just like God. God doesn't want you to be just like him. God was holding something back. God is being mean. God doesn't want you to experience this. And Eve looked at that fruit and said, you know, it looks pretty good. I think I'll try it. What happened? She ate, disobeying God. She was deceived. Then she gave to her husband, and he ate, not being deceived, and it plunged all humanity into sin. And was 
Was God being mean? Was God being unfair? No. God knew that in the day that they would eat thereof, they would surely die. They'd be separated from him. God was trying to protect man when he said, don't eat. Today, when God says, thou shalt not, it's not because God's being mean. It's because God loves us and wants what's best for us. But in order to believe that, we've got to trust him. Trust that God is good. When we hold up our faith in God in times of trouble, folks, it shows that our faith is not just in words. But it shows that we have a God who can truly be trusted. I mentioned Job earlier. Let's go back to the book of Job, chapter number 1. Just to really quickly sum up the, the first part of this account. Satan sought to get Job to curse God. And so he took away his possessions, he took away his children, he took away just about everything that Job had. And we drop down to verse number 20 of the chapter. Job chapter 1, verse number 20. It says, Then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground. Stop right there. Job is, is tearing his mantle. He's putting dust on his head. He's in sackcloth and ashes. He's mourning for his loss, especially the loss of all of his children. But notice the next words in the verse. Job was mourning. Job was sad. Job was distraught. But then it says, and worshipped. He praised God and said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return hither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. How many of us, in our time of trouble and our deep sorrow, worship God? How much faith do we put in God? I don't know what's going to happen with these circumstances, but I know that God is good and God is going to take care of it. I know that God is bigger. I know that God has a plan. I just have to trust him. I can't see through the fog which way it's going, but I know God does. God can see clearly the end from the beginning. I will trust my God above all else. In all of this, Job sinned not nor charged God foolishly. Job had faith in God. And even though Satan attacked him on many different fronts in many different ways, and Satan brought a lot of affliction into his life, he continued to trust God. He had a big shield of faith. If we hold up our faith in God, folks, it will cause the devil to flee. Over in the book of James, chapter 4, it tells us to resist the devil and he will flee from you. People forget the first part of that verse, though. It says, draw nigh unto God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Folks, in order to quench the fiery darts of the wicked that are going to be hurled at us, we must have faith in God. If he's good enough to save our eternal soul, He's good enough to take care of us every day. He's good enough to take care of us in every situation. I pray today you have a large shield of faith that you will hold up for others to see so that God may receive all the glory. How big is your shield of faith today? I implore you, trust in the Lord God with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you again for the day you've blessed us with. Thank you for your scripture. Lord, thank you for these verses here in Ephesians that we can read to prepare ourselves for the battle with which we are engaged. Father, I just pray that you would increase our faith. Help us to look to you and God, realize you're good for every single situation that we face. There's nothing that is out of your power, out of your control. 
And even, Lord, when the things of life happen and things shake us, Lord, I just pray that we would look to you, cry out to you, and know that you are good, you are working, and, Lord, we can just trust you to guide every step of our path. May you be glorified today. Deal with our hearts in a way that would be pleasing to you. And again, Father, we just thank you for your blessings. And it's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen.